So for those who work in uh, different, different areas of concern around the Great Lakes, one of the, of the recurring themes is that the uncertainty stemming from knowledge gaps, lack of data, the ecological unknowns, natural variability, is a major confounding factor that poses challenges in the decision-making process. In face of this uncertainty, we often hear from the technical teams of the different remedial action plans that a critical piece of information that is missing is the rigorous assessment of the monetary values of different ecosystem services. This is the piece of information that we need to determine, usually, that sweet spot, that critical point where investments on the environment are on par with our socioeconomic values. Today, we're very happy to have perhaps the best person in the world to elaborate on these issues. Professor Kustanja is a Vice Chancellor's Chair in Public Policy at the Crawford School of Public Policy at the Australian National University. He's also a Senior Fellow at the National Council on Science and the Environment in the US, a Senior Research Fellow at the Stockholm Resilience Center, an Affiliate Fellow at the Gantt Institute for Ecological Economics, a Titao Master of Economics at, uh, Economics at the Titao Masters Academy in China, and a Fellow of the Royal Society of Arts at the UK. He is a co-founder of the um, International Society for Ecological Economics, and probably you know the uh, Society's General Economic, Ecological Economics, who was uh, the chief editor for several years. He serves on, more, on editorial boards for more than 10 international academic journals, and he's also founding co-editor-in-chief of Solutions, a unique hybrid academic and popular journal. Professor Costanza has authored or co-authored more than 600 scientific papers and 27 books. How do you do it? His work has been cited more than 75,000 times and has an HD index of 108. Bob, the stage is yours. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to be here. Um, <clears throat> you probably all know that we live in a whole new geologic epoch, uh, the Anthropocene, because of the magnitude of human influence on the functioning of the planet. Um, you know, we, it's no longer a world that's empty of humans and their artifacts. It's really a, a full world. Um, the implications of this is that business as usual is no longer an option. Uh, we really have to uh, <clears throat> think and act differently. Um, if our goals are to create a, a sustainable and desirable future, and I think that is a goal that we all share. How do we do that? Um, well, I think we have to integrate these three elements of having an adequate vision, first of all, of how the world is. I think that's our role as scientists. How do we understand how this complex, interdependent world of humans and, and the rest of nature uh, functions? How do we see it as a system? Um, and there's been, I think, a lot of progress in that regard uh, from the, from the uh, Earth system sciences, understanding how climate functions, and also from the uh, social sciences and understanding what actually does contribute to human well-being, the whole science of happiness, as it's called. Uh, how do we put all of those things together uh, to help us understand how the world functions, but also what's our vision of how the world, um, how we would like it to be? What are our goals for the future? Uh, that, that really is essential to motivate change. We have to have a a shared vision um, on, on the kind of world that we really want. And I think there's been a lot of progress along those lines as well. Uh, our tools and analytical techniques then have to be consistent with this changing vision. And I think that involves more systems thinking, uh, more modeling, uh, to understand those complex uh, interconnections. And our implementation strategies, I think, also uh, need to be more consistent. Uh, we need different and new kinds of institutions. Uh, and we may need some societal therapy to overcome our addiction to the current system. So um, we know, for example, uh, that the world's a complex, nonlinear, adaptive system. There are thresholds, there are tipping points, there are surprises uh, to be expected. Uh, so developing a better understanding of how the system functions, I think, is, is essential. This is just from a paper by uh, um, several authors, Tim Linton and others, um, about some of the potential tipping points in the climate system that could really change things quite quickly and quite dramatically, including melting the ice sheets, but there's a whole range of other uh, potential tipping elements. Uh, how do we understand that system for what it is? 
We know that some of the climate-driven changes, um, in, uh, in this case in ocean or, uh, oceans, are pose uh, significant risks uh, to ecosystems, to people, to industry. Uh, this, this shows that as we uh, change the climate, uh, those, those risks to the whole range of uh, organisms and ecosystem services increase uh, dramatically. So we're putting, we're putting our well-being uh, significantly at risk. We know that there are fundamental ecological constraints. You've probably seen some version of this paper about uh, planetary boundaries, recognizing that uh, at least three of these variables are, are probably well outside the safe operating space, including climate change, biodiversity loss, and, uh, and the nitrogen cycle, and several others are rapidly approaching uh, the, 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 the safe boundaries. Uh, how do we maintain uh, our system within those, that safe operating space? Unfortunately, this is not the movie that most people are lining up to go see. Um, so they would rather believe a, a reassuring lie. Um, <laughs> than this inconvenient truth. Uh, but part of the problem, I think, is the way we're framing the problem. Uh, you know, we're framing it as a, as a problem, as something we need to change. I think we need a third movie. Uh, we need a movie that's a, a new vision, a new narrative, you know, what is a positive, sustainable, and desirable economy in society in the rest of nature look like? And first of all, recognize this change in, in vision, our understanding of the world. Recognize that the economy is not some separate thing from the environment. The economy is embedded in society, embedded in uh, the rest of nature, and we need to understand it as an integrated, complex system. Uh, <clears throat> so. Um, there have been efforts along those lines. Uh, this field of ecological economics um, that was mentioned has these three integrated goals or questions to, to maintain an ecologically sustainable scale or size of the economy within this larger system, recognizing uh, that, that embeddedness, so staying within planetary boundaries. Um, having a socially fair distribution of resources, both within the current generation of humans and, and also between the current and future generations and between humans and other species. So this whole issue of fairness and distribution, I think, is a key element uh, that's, that's beginning to get more traction as we recognize just how unequal uh, that distribution is now. <clears throat> and finally, to have an economically efficient allocation of resources, but um, considering all of the resources that contribute to human well-being, not just the ones that are currently included in the market. So all of our natural and social capital assets have to be included in that allocation. We're certainly not uh, at a sustainable scale. We're certainly not, don't have a fair distribution, and we're not uh, allocating things efficiently uh, at the moment. So we need to make some changes. We need to recognize that there are these planetary boundaries, but there's also the elements of well-being and quality of life that we need to create within those boundaries. So we need to stay in what Kate Rayworth has called the, uh, uh, the donut. Um, <clears throat> how do we do that? Um, you've probably heard of the, uh, the UN Sustainable Development Goals uh, process. I think this is a, a significant step uh, in, in the right direction. It's the, probably the first time in human history that all countries in the world have agreed on a set of, of goals. Uh, so this doesn't apply just to developing countries. It's all countries, uh, including Canada, including the United States. I don't think Trump has backed off of this one yet. Um, he probably doesn't know about it yet, but. Um, <laughs> uh, but I think it's a significant step. And you can see from this list of goals, they cover much more than, than uh, conventional economic growth. No, eliminating poverty, hunger, good health, quality education, gender and, and uh, general uh, equality, uh, you know, uh, <clears throat> renewable energy. As far as the environment cons is concerned, are three sort of directly relevant uh, goals. You know, urgent action on climate, uh, and protecting uh, both marine and, and terrestrial uh, resources. Uh, but I think uh, one thing that's, that's kind of missing from this is that the recognition that all of these goals are highly interconnected as well. Uh, there are significant synergies and trade-offs among them. Uh, they all contribute in different ways uh, to these sort of mid-level goals of scale, distribution, and allocation, uh, and to the overarching goal of you know, creating a prosperous, high quality of life that's equitably shared and sustainable, a goal I think that we, that we all share. So I think there's a, there's a lot of research that still needs to be done in, in understanding these interconnections and how they, how they relate to each other, uh, if our goal is really to create this sustainable and desirable future. Unfortunately, um, I think a lot of our decision makers are still stuck in this empty world vision of the economy, uh, which, which looks something like this. You have the, 
primary factors of production, as they're called, land, labor, and capital, with land is kind of grayed out, and I guess you could include water there as well, because uh, <clears throat> it's assumed uh, there's almost public, perfect substitutability between these factors. You don't really need natural resources, you just substitute more labor or capital to produce uh, goods and services, um, marketed goods and services, things that are captured in GDP, which are then either consumed or reinvested to build more capital for the next period. Um, and that the, the primary um, assumptions of this, the basic premises, are that more is always better. You know, GDP is a good proxy for welfare. Uh, we need to keep GDP growing. That's, that's what a healthy economy looks like. Um, and that there's nothing in this vision that would limit that growth. Uh, you know, so the economy can grow forever. The scale issue is not really uh, a problem. Um, how do you solve poverty? Well, you just make the pie bigger. Um, you know, we know that that's, that doesn't really work uh, because that, that pie only gets, goes to the 1% the of the, the population. In this vision, nature's kind of a, a sideshow, not really important, and that private property is always best because you're, you're talking about goods and services that are marketed and best captured in the, the market economy. So we need a different vision of the world, first of all, <clears throat> um, and how the world functions. Recognizing that we live in a materially closed Earth system, everything has to go somewhere, that, that these four types, basic categories of assets are all um, important in some more balanced way uh, to produce conventional goods and services, but also to produce human well-being more broadly conceived. Uh, and they include the conventional built capital, human capital, individual people, uh, but, but including their health, their, their uh, intelligence, their, 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 their education, um, <clears throat> social capital, all of the interactions among people, all of our formal and informal networks, our culture, our, our uh, institutions, uh, all of those are extremely important. And finally, natural capital, everything else that we didn't have to uh, create, the gifts, gifts of nature. Um, <clears throat> and all four of those components are, are important. We also have to understand um, what human well-being really is and how, to, and how to produce it. So there's been a lot of work, I think, along those lines as well. Um, what what con constitutes quality of life? What constitutes well-being? Um, it includes at least these, these three elements of, uh, and there's been a lot of work, I said, on this idea of subjective well-being. They ask people in surveys, you know, how satisfied are you with your life on a scale of one to 10? And what does that, that depend on? Uh, it turns out it depends on a whole range of basic human needs, which are much broader than simply consumption and include things like uh, reproduction, security, affection, understanding, participation, all the things that, that you'll probably recognize as things that, that actually do make you, make you happy. Um, what we can do from a policy perspective is create the opportunities for people to meet those needs and, and feel this sense of, uh, of well-being by how we arrange our assets, our built, our human, our social, and our natural capital, and how we, how we use our time. Uh, so recognizing that quality of life, well-being, is a much more complex um, function than simply the more we consume, the better off we are, I think is, is a first step. Ecosystem services are a major contributor uh, to that, uh, to that well-being, uh, the benefits that people derive from functioning ecosystems. So you're probably all familiar with that term, and you may have seen this diagram before from the Millennium Ecosystem Assessment which categorizes these services into these four broad categories of provisioning, regulating, cultural, and, uh, and supporting services. And there are various connections to the different elements of human well-being that I, that I just mentioned. There is one thing missing, I think, from this diagram, and that is the interaction with the other forms of capital that are, that are really essential uh, to make ecosystem services contribute to well-being. Um, and maybe this diagram says it a little bit better, um, and that, that we need to, to look at that complex interaction as really uh, what we're, we're talking about. This, uh, this is the challenge, I think, for, for all of us to understand how these different types of assets um, interact with each other and contribute to uh, creating uh, sustainable uh, human well-being. It's inherently a transdisciplinary uh, kind of problem. Uh, you're not going to understand this interaction just by understanding the ecology or the economics or the sociology or, uh, or the, the, the built capital uh, or the economics of the system. So, <clears throat> you know, our universities are generally not set up for that, for that kind of, of work, uh, but I think they are um, and need to move much more, quick, more quickly in that direction. From a policy perspective, this idea of ecosystem services is getting some traction now in the... Uh, 
Intergovernmental Science Policy Platform on Biodiversity and Ecosystem Services, or IPBES, uh, which is kind of an IPCC equivalent uh, for, uh, for biodiversity and ecosystem services. That's about to come out with some assessments. There is the Ecosystem Services Partnership, if you want to learn more about who's doing what in this area uh, and, and contribute to this, take a look at, uh, at this website and potentially join, uh, join this group. Um, in the academic community, uh, there's been a huge upsurge in, in research on this topic of ecosystem services. This is from Scopus uh, last year, I guess, uh, but there's now more than 3,000 articles a year you know, being published on the topic of ecosystem services. So <clears throat> who here has been involved in one of these, one of these articles, who's published in, uh, in one of these papers? Okay, not many of you. <laughs> So we need to improve that. <laughs> um, <clears throat> the most highly cited of those papers is this one that we did back in 1997, which estimated, um, it was kind of a meta-analysis that looked at all the research that had been done at that time and estimated the total value of 17 different services across 16 different biomes. And we came up with an estimate with a capital E uh, of about $33 trillion a year, much bigger than global GDP at the time. Um, one thing we didn't control was what they put on the cover of this, of the magazine. They said pricing the planet. We didn't really mean pricing as much as valuing <clears throat> in the sense that many, if not most of these services are not, not things that are traded in markets or should be traded in markets, but things that do contribute to sustainable well-being. Uh, so we're trying to estimate uh, that, that contribution. Um, <clears throat> More recently, there was a study called TEEB, The Economics of Ecosystems and Biodiversity, uh, funded partly by uh, Deutsche Bank and, uh, and, and UNEP, uh, which um, <clears throat> uh, updated uh, some of the, the values that we used in that uh, 1997 study. Uh, and this just shows the range of unit values, that do, the, the value per hectare per year uh, across different, uh, different ecosystems. And you can see that there's quite a range, but, but some of these, particularly wetland ecosystems, um, are, are, uh, are pr provide huge um, contributions uh, to well-being that are, that are often neglected in, uh, in our policy decisions. Um, and just for example, this shows the number of estimates uh, that this database uh, included uh, across these different ecosystems. You can see that that wetlands in general have been, have been quite intensively studied, but uh, rivers and lakes, uh, not so much. Uh, so I think there's a lot of opportunity for additional research on, on uh, ecosystem services across um, <clears throat> really all of these, uh, these biomes and more. Uh, but, uh, but so far we have um, <clears throat> uh, at least those estimates to go on. Um, and there's different ways of aggregating these estimates up to get uh, sort of larger uh, aggregations, including uh, th what we used in the, um, the nature paper was simply to assume that um, there's an average value per hectare of, of particular ecosystems and multiply that by areas. Uh, you, can, you can get better estimates by empl employing expert um, uh, assessments uh, to, say, to see how those values differ, differ from systems that are in better or, or worse quality. Um, you can do a, a more statistical kind of value transfer. If there you have enough estimates of the value of a particular system, you can begin to build statistical models to say what influences that variation. Or you can do more spatially explicit uh, functional modeling, I think is, the, is where we need to go um, in the future to, to really look at how these systems are interconnected and how they function. I'll give you one quick example of a study we did of the value of coastal wetlands for hurricane protection or storm protection. Um, this is Hurricane Katrina approaching the coast of Louisiana. It produced a storm surge of, of 18 uh, to 20 feet, I think it was, um, largely because of the loss of the coastal wetlands uh, protecting New Orleans uh, <clears throat> that uh, over the last 100 years or so have really been decimated because of the um, levying of the Mississippi River uh, so that the sediments that were building that deltaic plain are now going off the edge of the continental shelf and, and uh, creating a dead zone there. Uh, oil and gas exploration with uh, canals cut through the, uh, uh, through the wetlands, changing the hydrology. So there's, there's been a significant loss of those wetlands. <clears throat> what we can do then is look at the tracks of the, uh, uh, the historical tracks of hurricanes uh, and build a database uh, that includes um, the, the swath of the storm, uh, the area of wetlands in the swath, we can get from uh, GIS data, 
uh, the, the GDP or the, uh, the infrastructure uh, that's, that's uh, in the swath, that which you can get from nighttime satellite imagery, and the amount of damage that each storm caused and the, uh, and the, and the intensity of the storm. That allows us to build a simple statistical model uh, that can predict the, uh, the relative damages as a function of wind speed and, and wetland area. Uh, and from that, then we can, we can estimate what's the avoided cost, uh, how much less would the damage be if we add another hectare of, of wetlands, uh, for example. Um, <clears throat> that sim relatively simple relationship, and this is a, a, a more complex uh, function, of course, but uh, it allows us to to, uh, est to predict about 60% of the variation in the, the relative damages from those storms. And from that, then we can map <clears throat> both the marginal and the total value of these wetlands for, for storm protection uh, from an avoided cost point of view. You can see that the larger values there are where those three variables come together. You have a lot of infrastructure to be protected, you have a lot of storms to be protected from, and you have a lot of wetlands to do the protecting in South Florida and Louisiana and some other, some other locations. And from that, we can say that you know the the, uh, <clears throat> the loss of one hectare results in a loss of uh, you know around thirty three thousand um, dollars uh, in in storm damages uh, on average, with a median of about five thousand. Uh, you take into account the probability of of, uh, of hits, and there's a large range, you know, uh, but a large mean value as well and median value for the uh, the value of an average hectare of wetlands. And if you add it all up, then you can get, come up with an estimate of the, the value of coastal wetlands uh, uh, nationwide of about $23 billion a year just in storm protection services. Now, <clears throat> um, I think this has had some influence on policy in, in Louisiana, for example, recognizing that these protecting wetlands, you know, these sort of horizontal levees do storm protection, but they also do a range of other things. They, they provide for, for fisheries, for recreation, for this whole range of other ecosystem services. So, the co-benefits uh, are much better than, than simply building levees along the coast. Um, <clears throat> we know also that um, when you modify uh, ecosystems, uh, we're, we're, these days anyway, we're generally suffering a loss in, in the total value from those systems. If you take an intact wetland and convert it to intensive farming, uh, you may be getting some private benefits, but you're really losing uh, the social benefits that, that, uh, that we're, we're talking about, the ecosystem services. Uh, likewise, for most of the other uh, transformations that we're talking about here. Um, a few years ago, we did a global estimate and said, well, what's the benefit-cost ratio of protecting uh, the nat these natural capital assets? Um, and we used a scenario where we increased the global reserve network to cover 15% of the terrestrial biosphere and 30% of the marine biosphere, and that was estimated to cost about $45 billion a year to build and maintain. You know, it seems like a lot of money, but the net benefits, the difference between the value of the intact system and what it might be converted to was about four to five trillion a year. So benefit cost ratio of 100 to one. <clears throat> it's a pretty good investment. Anybody know of a better investment than that these days? I could only find one, and that was for oil companies investing in political campaigns in the United States, <laughs> which unfortunately is about a 400 to one return on investment. Um, so, uh, but I think there are many more investments like that that are, that are possible, uh, you know, that, that the return, if you're able to estimate at least what the social value is, what the ecosystem service value of those resources is, is, uh, is significant. We are sort of headed in that same direction. This is from a recent estimate that we now have 15% of the terrestrial regions and 3.4% of the oceans in some sort of protected status. Now, how, how well protected they are is a whole other question, uh, but I think that there's, there's at least some movement uh, to, to, to actually implement that kind of uh, protection of our, our natural capital assets. Um, we also looked recently about, well, how have the value of those ecosystem services changed in this period from 1997 when we did the original, that original study to more recently 2011 in this case. Um, and um, we found that, um, that we, over that period, due, due largely to land use changes, um, we have we've saw increased desertification, increased loss of wetlands, um, loss of coral reefs, et cetera, um, that we've lost about $20 trillion a year in, in ecosystem service values. Uh, this is sort of how we did it. You know, you can look at the, um, <clears throat> the, the area of those systems, uh, the unit values, which have improved due to the TEAB study. 
uh, and how we put those together to get the change in value. Uh, and just, I'm just highlighting the lakes and rivers and floods and, and, uh, and swamps and floodplains as well, which are, you know, are very significant in terms of their, uh, their unit values and their, their areas. So they're, they're some of the big contributors. There's often the question comes up, well, how does this relate to GDP and things, measurements like that? Uh, and this diagram sort of estimates, you know, what that relationship is, that, that these services are, are much more than GDP. We said about 125 trillion a year in, in, in 2011, whereas, you, whereas GDP was about 75 trillion globally. Um, the area of overlap is kind of um, an open question because um, many of these services, or some of them are picked up in GDP, things like some recreation values, some provisioning services, et cetera. But as you can see from this, many of them are not. Uh, so it's, it's a much bigger uh, thing than simply uh, a small component of GDP. It's really, it's really a much larger thing. Um, <clears throat> there are also these different services have different spatial characteristics. Uh, some services are, you might call global, non-proximal, you know, carbon sequestration. It doesn't really matter where that happens. It's going to contribute to, uh, <coughs> to uh, the, the, that service of climate regulation regardless. Whereas others are more proximal, this idea of disturbance regulation or storm protection depends on the proximity of uh, the beneficiaries to the service. Several of them are related to the, the, uh, the flow of, of uh, particularly water uh, and nutrients uh, across the landscape. So you need um, <clears throat> watershed scale at, at minimum uh, kinds of, of capabilities there. Uh, and others are in situ or, or related to the movement of users. So there's different spatial characteristics uh, and you can sort of subdivide these, these systems that way. Um, property rights, I think, are also an important consideration uh, when you're talking about ecosystem services, and you can, you can uh, think of these things as broken down into either rival uh, or, or excludable kinds of uh, resources. Rival resources are things that, you know, if, I, if, I, if one person consumes them, they're not available for other people to benefit from. If I eat the apple, you can't eat the same apple. Uh, <clears throat> Non-rival are the reverse. Everyone can benefit uh, without affecting other people's uh, benefic benef benefiting. Excludable has to do with, you know, how easy is it to prevent people from benefiting, you know, unless they, unless they pay you something. Markets work relatively well, uh, you know, with rival and excludable goods and services, so some provisioning services. Uh, but <clears throat> the other kinds of um, uh, ecosystem services fit into these other three categories and are not really well, well handled by, uh, by markets. Uh, they're, they're public goods of some kind, or common pool resources. So we need to do, we need some different kinds of institutions uh, that can better deal with the, uh, the common resource uh, assets, that, as these are called. And certainly the Great Lakes fit into that category quite, quite well. Um, <clears throat> you may have heard of Eleanor Ostrom, who's the first and only woman to ever win the Nobel Prize in economics uh, for her work on, on uh, how to manage the commons. And she's done a lot of work on, you know, what, what sort of institutions can can be successful and have been successful in, in indigenous communities and, and elsewhere uh, in effectively managing common property resources. And you do need clear boundaries, you need you know, uh, rules for, for how to manage those resources, but private property is not, is, uh, is not the only or, or often the best way uh, to go about managing these resources. Uh, this idea of common asset trusts uh, might be a better way uh, to think about uh, how to manage the, these, uh, these kinds of resources. Um, <clears throat> we've also looked at um, what might happen to ecosystem services and quality of life and well-being going out into the future. And one way of doing that is, to, is through this process of scenario planning. And scenario pl scenarios and scenario planning has been used quite, quite a lot. This is a, a group of scenarios originally came from the Great Transition Initiative, but they seem to be fairly archetypical uh, of a lot of scenarios that, uh, that, get, that, that go forward. Um, and you can think of them as arrayed to, according to these two axes. So, you know, do we continue to focus on GDP growth? Do we focus more narrowly on, on, uh, on the market? Uh, or do we focus on this broader idea of well-being <clears throat> uh, that, that might be encapsulated in the sustainable development goals? Um, do we, and on the other axis, do we focus on individualism uh, or on, on community? 
uh, the sort of business as usual, market forces kind of scenario is uh, individualistic, focused on GDP growth. Policy reform has more government uh, intervention, but still focused on GDP growth. Whereas the great transition, I think, is more consistent with the, the SDGs and with this idea of, you know, we're all in it together and we need governance at many levels and, and it's about more stewardship and, and sharing rather than, uh, than, than simply uh, growth at all costs. Um, how do we communicate those alternatives uh, to a broader public? Um, and, you know, this, I think, is an opportunity for the, the arts and humanities communities uh, to contribute to some of the, the work that we're doing. Uh, what would it be like to live in, you know, the Great Transition Initiative? Uh, and how, how could people uh, sort of imagine themselves in those, in those kinds of worlds as opposed to the, the market forces or GDP growth or even fortress world? <clears throat> Uh, as far as ecosystem services, then we, we took those scenarios and what they implied for land use change and other and how we manage ecosystems and projected out uh, what they would mean for the value, the global value of ecosystem services out to 2050. You can see that the great transition implies a, a recovery, a restoration of those those services, whereas um, fortress world and, and uh, market forces imply a continuing decline and policy reform could probably stabilize things at least for a while. That would be <clears throat> distributed across the planet in different ways because of where those land use changes would occur. Uh, but but uh, essentially, uh, all countries could benefit from uh, a, a, a focus on um, the great transition kind of scenario uh, that the SDGs imply. Um, there are some mistaken identities, I think, concerning ecosystem services and their valuation. Um, one is that the recognition that economics is not the same thing as the market, uh, even though that's often the way it comes across. Uh, you know, economics really is about how do we manage our, our system? How do we manage our lives? How do we allocate resources, et cetera? And the market is just one institution for doing that uh, among <clears throat> many possible ones, as, as, I've, as I've said. Uh, recognizing that this valuation is not the same as privatization or commodification or trading because we are talking about public goods in, uh, in large, large part. So it's really about trying to estimate the value of those uh, public goods towards human well-being, not necessarily for the purpose of exchanging them in markets. And a lot of the, the estimates of those values don't come from market exchanges. They come from other, other sources. <clears throat> That's part of the point, uh, that, that the market does not cover those resources. And expressing the values in monetary units does not the same thing as these market or exchange values. We can, the reason for using monetary units is simply because that, those are units that communicate with people. Uh, you can sort of get a feel for how large these values are, as I was saying, relative to other things that people know about. You could use other units if you thought that would work. You know, you could express these in terms of energy units. You could express them in land units or time units or any other <clears throat> resource that's traded uh, but, uh, or traded off, uh, but, you know, I, I think that as, as we pointed out, if you're talking about um, <clears throat> trade-offs and, and investments, um, that this, these are units that often uh, help uh, to make that point. Also, uh, we have to remember that you can't avoid this valuation because every time we make a decision about ecosystems, we are implicitly valuing them one way or the other. So the question is, can we make that more explicit? Can we uh, begin to bring in uh, the, the, the values of ecosystems uh, into the decision-making process more, uh, more appropriately. So <clears throat> there are a range of uses for this ecosystem service valuation uh, from simply raising awareness and interest, and I think some of the global assessments uh, really are mainly in that, in that category, uh, just making the point that these things are really important. Uh, but they can also be used in modifying national income and well-being accounts. Uh, so, as I'll say a bit more later, you know, GDP is really insufficient as a policy goal. How do you bring in uh, the value of ecosystem services to uh, national income accounts for a whole range of specific policy analyses, you know, having to do with uh, what, what are the best investments we can make, urban and regional planning, you know, what kind of landscape is going to provide the best uh, or the optimal combination of these assets uh, to, to uh, create the more sus most sustainable and desirable uh, outcomes. Uh, this idea of payment for ecosystem services. Uh, so uh, often we can provide incentives uh, to private landowners uh, to uh, 
uh, to produce not just uh, market, market goods, but also the public goods, like ecosystem services, and been a whole uh, raft of these kinds of systems uh, implemented in different, different countries recently. This idea of full cost accounting, um, we know that the price of everything that we buy in the market today is really not, uh, not the right price. It's, it's really underestimating, in many cases, uh, the, the true cost of providing these things because it's leaving out all of the externalities. It's leaving out the effects on climate, the effects on ecosystem services, et cetera. And there are um, <clears throat> efforts uh, to try to estimate what those external costs are. Um, I'm involved with a company called True Cost out of the UK that does just that and, and shows that much of the profit of today's corporations is really you know, mislabeled as profit. It's really external costs that are being called profits and they're not really making a social profit at all. And this idea of common asset trusts, you know, how do we, how do we manage these systems as a community asset rather than as, as private property? So, you know, I think even the Pope has, uh, has gotten the message uh, in this regard. This is an interesting quote, you know, that, uh, <coughs> that businesses are calculating and paying only a fraction of the cost involved, and yet, and when the economic and social costs of using up shared environmental resources are recognized with transparencies and fully borne by those who incur them, not by other peoples or future generations, only then you know, can those actions be considered ethical. So there is an, an ethical dimension to this as well. And how do we make sure that we're um, incorporating uh, you know, the costs and the benefits of ecosystems into our decision making? Um, <clears throat> this was an interesting survey done recently of uh, Australian coastal and marine management types, uh, about 80 of them, and they asked them, you know, this whole range of ecosystem services here, you know, how important did they think the valuation of these services was to their, to their work? And you can see in general, they thought, were, they, thought they, were, uh, they were pretty important. Um, uh, they also asked them, however, uh, how much they trusted those estimates, and you can see that they're a little bit less trusting of, uh, particularly some of the ones that are, that are not so direct. You know, commercial fisheries, yes. You know, materials provision, yes. But as you go down the line and total economic value of the things that I've been talking about, uh, <clears throat> not really, you know, trusting those estimates as much. So I think there's still a lot of work to do in terms of improving these estimates. And uh, one of the problems is that the conventional economic view really only looks at the contribution of ecosystems to this goal of, of efficiency or efficient allocation, as I said. Um, it's, it's based on current individual preferences. Uh, it doesn't really require a lot of uh, discussion or scientific input. You know, it assumes that people know what they want and they can just express those preferences either in the market or in some sort of pseudo market kind of, um, kind of venue. Um, <clears throat> we know that that's, that's probably not, uh, not a great assumption. But it also leaves out the other two uh, goals that we're trying to achieve, of fairness and sustainability. And for the goal of fairness, you're going to require a lot more discussion. Uh, you need to have you know, sort of deliberative groups uh, discussing these, these values or some other mechanism uh, to reveal the community preferences. And you might need some ideas around John Rawls' uh, idea of the veil of ignorance. You know, people voted as if they didn't know where they were in the social structure, they would vote more, fair, more fairly. And finally, for sustainability purposes, you're going to need a lot more modeling, uh, a lot more analysis of how these systems function uh, in, the, <clears throat> in, the, in the broader sense and how they function over, over time. Uh, can you make some predictions or, or projections uh, into the future to say, is this really a sustainable uh, system or not? So <clears throat> it's going to take, I think, a much more integrated modeling of humans embedded in ecological systems. Uh, not just modeling the ecosystems, but modeling the people and modeling how the people in those ecosystems interact with each other over time. There's not one right approach to that. Um, I think it's going to take what you might call intelligent pluralism, you know, recognizing that all models are wrong, but you know, some models are, are uh, more useful than others. Uh, in multiple, multiple scales in time, space, and complexity, and you can actually use this process of constructing models and, and running them as a consensus building process. You know, can you get stakeholders involved uh, in trying to conceptualize uh, how this complex system functions, contribute their, their, uh, their knowledge to it, um, acknowledging uncertainty and limited predictability, acknowledging the values of stakeholders, and, 
acknowledging the, the sort of long-term evolution, co-evolution of humans and cultures and, and uh, uh, going forward. So um, <clears throat> we, there have been a few attempts, I think, to build these kinds of integrated models. This is one we did a few years ago at the global scale uh, that was really focused on ecosystem services and their valuation and can you extract you know, from these models uh, estimates of the value of ecosystem services and the answer is, is yes, you can. Uh, you can also do these kinds of models certainly at the landscape scale <clears throat> um, uh, and, uh, and try to integrate both the uh, biophysical dynamics and the uh, human and economic dynamics uh, in these systems and there's, uh, there's been a range of, of applications like that. Um, <clears throat> it's an interesting model that we did recently uh, that uh, went back and tried to look at the, uh, um, the rise and fall of the, the Maya civilization. So if you want to understand sustainability, uh, it's good to understand, you know, societies that were not sustainable and why they were not sustainable. And this was kind of a spatially explicit, hybrid, process-based, and agent-based model that ran over 600 years and was able to get the, the sort of collapse dynamics that we, that we saw with the Maya civilization. Uh, largely as a result of the combination of factors of the loss of ecosystem services and deforestation, the, the uh, sort of rise in population, the rise of this uh, trade network, and, uh, and eventually uh, they became susceptible to the, uh, the uh, drought cycles that occurred and, uh, and couldn't recover from, uh, from one of them because of that interaction. Um, ultimately, I think we need these sort of integrated models that um, uh, can be applied at multiple scales, you know, from small, from small watersheds all the way up to the global scale that, that put together uh, all of these, the basic pieces uh, and, and can tell us what ecosystem services are, um, are doing under different situations. Um, <clears throat> we're trying now to get, we've been trying to get funding to do this for a while, but <laughs> uh, this idea of creating uh, a gaming platform on top of these models, uh, so in what you might call integrated games, um, that have uh, not only a research uh, uh, dimension, uh, but also an entertainment and an education uh, component. So, you know, I've been, uh, it's, I've heard that uh, uh, we currently, as a species, spend about three billion hours a week playing computer games. So uh, if we can get, you know, some small fraction of those hours spent playing games with a purpose, you know, um, then I think we can make a lot of progress, both in terms of entertaining people, but also educating them about what ecosystem services are and using them as research tools to say, well, what kind of trade-offs are people making in these games? We can sort of keep track of, of every move that they make and uh, <clears throat> use that to help understand how they're valuing these, these services, how that value changes as they learn more about how the system functions, uh, et cetera. So I think there's a lot, a lot to go on there. So <clears throat> how am I doing? Finally. Uh, to create a sustainable and desirable economy in society and nature, I think it's going to require a couple of things. And the first one is, how do we break our addiction to this growth at all costs economic paradigm, to fossil fuels, to overconsumption? And I think thinking of it as an addiction is really quite, quite accurate. We're sort of locked into the current system because of all of the positive feedbacks that it has in the short term. Even though we recognize you know, the long-term consequences, uh, we're sort of ignoring those uh, because of the strength of the the short-term feedbacks. How do you get, how do you overcome addictions? Um, well, as I'll show, one, one uh, important way to do that is to spend more time uh, envisioning this more sustainable and desirable future that focuses on well-being and quality of life. Uh, <clears throat> we know that, that GDP uh, was never designed as a measure of societal well-being. This is from uh, a quote from Simon Kuznets, who was one of the architects of, uh, of GDP, you, and he clearly warned, you know, at the beginning, you can't infer the welfare of a nation from, from GDP. Um, you know, when you're talking about goals for more growth, you have to specify, you know, growth of what and, and for what purpose. Um, so uh, GDP was really only designed as a measure of sort of economic activity in the market. It's really measuring the cost of producing things, not the benefits that come, come from those things, and can be very misleading if you try to use it as a, as a policy goal. Um, you know, if there's more oil spills, somebody has to go clean up the oil spill, that's gonna add to GDP, but it's not really a, a benefit. Uh, GDP counts more, you know, uh, 
more pollution as a, as a positive thing because we have to go and clean it up. So it's got a, a lot of problems as a, as a policy goal. Um, <clears throat> on the positive side, you could argue that it would probably help to win World War II. Uh, and that was one of its original uses because it helps to understand how to produce all of these things you know, in, the, in the economy. How do we produce more guns and planes and, and, and ships, et cetera? And we really needed that you know, to, to win that sort of all-out war. But those days are gone, hopefully. And, uh, and now all of the side effects of GDP are beginning to show up. Um, and the fact that it's a mismeasure of, of policy goals. We know, for example, that if you plot GDP per capita against uh, life satisfaction, you're asking people how satisfied they are with their life, you get graphs that look like this. There's a, there's an increase, a rapid increase at first, uh, but beyond a relatively low GDP per capita, uh, <clears throat> there's not much of a relationship. You know, Costa Rica has has just as high life satisfaction as the United States with a third of the GDP per capita. So <clears throat> it's not really improving our life satisfaction, especially because a lot of it is being distributed only to a very small fraction of the, of the population. So it's well past time, I think, to leave GDP behind as our, as our measure of progress and begin to look at broader measures. Uh, and this was a, a list of some of the possibilities that are out there. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about this first one on the list, the Genuine Progress Indicator, which is one of a group that uh, modifies GDP to try to at least get at the, the net benefits rather than just the, the, gross, the gross revenues. Uh, there's a whole series of them that are based on um, life satisfaction surveys, including uh, Bhutan's Gross National Happiness Surveys uh, and the World Value Survey that were used as, as the basis of that graph I just showed. And then there's a whole range of them that are based on indicators, you know, uh, a range of indicators that are put together uh, in indices, including the Human Development Index and more recently the OECD uh, Better Life Index, um, which is really interesting. But I'll just talk a bit about the GPI. Uh, it starts with personal consumption, which is a major component of GDP, but then it, it weights that by income distribution. So it gets, it gets in this fairness uh, component uh, into the, the assessment. It adds a few things that are left out, like household labor and volunteer work, which are important con contributions to well-being, but are not marketed, so they're, they're ignored. Um, and it then subtracts a bunch of things that should best be thought of as costs. You know, the, the cost of commuting, the cost of crime, uh, all the things in green are uh, cost, natural capital uh, costs, the, the cost of water and air pollution, and uh, uh, the loss, depletion of non-renewable resources. Um, <clears throat> We looked at 17 different countries around the world that had estimated this and came up with a global estimates of GPI per capita versus GDP per capita. And you can see that up until about 1980 or so, uh, we were experiencing what you might call economic growth. The economy was growing and so was this broader measure of well-being. But beyond that, uh, we're now and have been since about 1980 in a period of uneconomic growth. The economy has been growing, or GDP has been growing, but you know, genuine progress has, has stagnated or, or declined slightly. Why? Because increasing inequality um, and uh, increasing environmental damage uh, have, have sort of uh, uh, <clears throat> taken away the positive benefits of that, that GDP growth. Uh, so I think that's something we really need to, to consider. And a lot of that, um, the environmental part, anyway, is the loss of ecosystem services. Um, <clears throat> I think that's, it's not the perfect indicator. Um, as I said, and I think we need to make some progress on modeling and measuring sustainable well-being in connection with the UN Sustainable Development Goals. How do we put all of those things together uh, and come up with a measure of, of, uh, of well-being that's, that's broader? And it, there's an effort now to generate what you might call GPI 2.0, uh, <clears throat> which includes these additional elements. Uh, GPI includes the cost components, for example, the depletion of natural capital. It doesn't include the positive contributions from ecosystem services or the positive contributions from, from human and social capital. Uh, so <clears throat> putting that all together, I think we could create some hybrid indicators of well-being uh, that, that will really help to guide us uh, toward the kind of future that we want. But even with those, as I said, we are um, addicted to this, to this current system. How do we overcome those addictions to, uh, to GDP growth? And we did a paper recently uh, that looked at um, what we could learn from what works to overcome individual addictions 
to overcoming these societal addictions. Uh, you know, it turns out that, you know, the worst thing you can say to an addict really is you're doing the wrong thing, you gotta stop doing this, you know, it's just hurting you. You know, that, that immediately gets a very defensive denial kind of reaction, and that's exactly the kind of reaction you get, we're getting from society when you frame these issues in that sort of confrontational way. So one thing that seems to work at the individual scale is called motivational interviewing, where you focus on a positive discussion of the addict's life goals, motives, you know, in their, their future. What kind of life do they want? Uh, is what they're doing now helping them achieve that or not? And that, that sort of framing uh, tends to work a lot better. So what's the analogy for that at the societal level? And I would argue that it's, it's some form of scenario planning, envisioning, how do we get society to think about the kind of world that we really want um, in a positive way? Uh, and then use that <coughs> uh, sort of shared vision as a way to motivate uh, the kinds of changes that we want. We've actually done um, <clears throat> some work now to try to get uh, at least some public opinion surveys of alternative futures uh, with uh, a, a, a survey that we did in Australia using these, these four uh, future scenarios. We changed the wording a bit from the Great Transition Initiative because uh, there was a, the, uh, the fear that uh, <clears throat> the, the labels were a little too value laden, you know, so we didn't want to say fortress world, rather so we said strong individualism, you know, people might, might like strong individualism. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, but basically, I think these are fairly archetypical and the community well-being scenario is kind of the, the, uh, uh, <clears throat> the great transition uh, SDG uh, future. Um, anyway, uh, we put these out, you know, um, we, got, we got a survey of about 2,000 individuals to go and read about these different scenarios and then take a survey. And these are the initial results that we got from these uh, 2,000 individuals Rant, um, representative of the Australian population. And you can see that the community well-being scenario was, was by far the, the most desired um, of these futures. The point, the point is, how do we get people to think about the fact that there, is, there are alternative futures? We're not sort of stuck with uh, the way things seem to be headed. Uh, this is a process that, that has allowed transformations at, the, at other scales, at the community scale, at the scale of individual businesses. That seems to be a very effective way of getting a major shift is to say, here's a, here's a different future that we want. How do we, how do we then go about getting it? Of course, <clears throat> there's always a skeptic in the back of the room, you know, what if it's all a big hoax and we create this better world for nothing, he's saying. So, but the point is, how do we focus more on what the better world looks like? How do we create the more positive vision of this world, one, that, one that's gonna have uh, sus sustainable well-being, more equitably distributed, uh, for everyone. Um, <clears throat> we need to communicate what those solutions are, um, and so this uh, journal that we've started called Solutions is, a, is an effort to uh, <clears throat> provide a venue for that kind of discussion. Our rule of thumb is that no more than a third of each article can be about describing the problem and two-thirds about describing the solutions, so take a look at that one. Um, I'm also going to be the chief editor-in-chief of this journal, the Anthropocene Review, uh, so <clears throat> this is another venue for talking about uh, how to solve these problems in, the, in a very interdisciplinary point uh, perspective. And I've also been involved in creating um, what's being called the Wellbeing Economy Alliance. Uh, how do we get all of the individuals, groups, governments, uh, NGOs, academics, who are thinking fairly similar um, thoughts uh, along these lines, but are not really allied with, not really coordinated with each other. Uh, we had a, an initial meeting of five governments hosted by Nicola Sturgeon there in the middle um, <clears throat> from uh, the First Minister of Scotland uh, and including Sweden, Costa Rica, Slovenia, and New Zealand uh, to begin, you know, uh, to, to create the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, the, the We 7 instead of the, the G7. How do we get a group of, uh, of governments, not just governments, but all the rest of, of society uh, to shift the focus away from GDP towards, uh, towards well-being and to begin the transition uh, that we we so sorely need. So thank you very much.
Well, if you had most desired and second most desired, I think it's, it's about 70% or so. so. And again, I think it's really an attempt to start the discussion you know, about, about what this world would really look like. Um, and I don't think you're ever going to get 100% of people to, to agree on, you know, on anything. Uh, but, <clears throat> but I think that's one way to overcome some of the divisions we see in society is to, is to focus on shared goals. Uh, so what are those shared goals? And I think you find, or at least I find, that when you put people in a room, and, and this was not a discussion of any kind, this was just a survey. Um, when you put people in a room and have some deliberation around that, people with different views, you know, and say, well, what kind of world do we really want? Uh, you'll get a lot more consensus than you, than you do get simply by having people argue about policies in the short term. And, you know, very little of our discussion, in fact, I think that's what democracy really should be all about, is having this, you know, discussion, building a shared vision of the world that we want, at least as a first step, uh, because if we don't do that, then we're always going to be in conflict. We have different ideas about where we're, where we're going. Yeah. Yes. It seems so beautiful, but do you think there could be a foundation that could provide funding to encourage, you know, the people that really need to become less addicted, like the politicians? <laughs> you know, like that nice person that we all Yeah. A foundation with funding would be great. If you know of any, <laughs> let me know. But, but uh, I think we'll find as we go forward with this, with uh, the We All group, uh, that there are you know, many more countries that I think that share these, these goals. Um, the small island, you know, uh, developing states, the, you know, there's, and, and also parts of, of countries. I was just in China, and actually China is now from the top leadership, you know, uh, saying what they want to do is build an ecological civilization. You know, what does that mean? Is that is that similar to what we're talking about? I mean, they have they have other issues as well, but um, at least China is a place and a big place where if the top leadership says we're going to do something, you know, it tends to happen relatively quickly, uh, and so they could convert to renewable energy much more quickly, perhaps, than than, uh, than other places. And if if that becomes their their core uh, goal, um, I think it could could make a big difference. But I'm open, if you know any, any foundations that, that would like to fund this work, <laughs> that would be great. Well. Um, I don't know, it's not as hard <laughs> as it seems maybe. Um, again, I think it, it's a question of focusing on the problem rather than focusing on, you know, the methods or the techniques that, that, that you use. Um, I think that's, that's uh, one way of, of getting the kind of interdisciplinary and transdisciplinary cooperation that's, that's required. The, the 1997 paper we did at, at NCs at the National Center for Ecological Analysis and Synthesis, and so this idea of having a, a synthesis center or process where you bring people from different areas together focused on a, a shared problem and give them the opportunity, the time, you know, the, the support uh, without too much structure and say, you know, uh, let's try to solve this problem. That's really what, what has worked, I think, in many cases in the past to, to build really innovative kinds of, kinds of things. You know, it's really, it's really discouraging that when you write a research grant, you know, you have to say what you're going to find. <laughs> and that's not really research. So. It's hard to get research that's that open-ended, you know, funded through the conventional channels, and I think that's really what we need more of. Yeah, I'm not sure I know the answer to that, but <laughs> it could just be historical accident, you know, that, that um, <clears throat> you know, wetlands were, were a focus of, of a lot of this initial uh, activity and work around ecosystem services, and it kind of hasn't migrated. It's been a, not much work on deserts, not much work on tundra as well, so I think, uh, and, and agro-ecosystems, I think, also need, um, you know, are kind of gaps in the, in the, uh, in the agenda, so 
but that's, that's why I'm here talking to all of you. You know, we need to, <laughs> we need to start filling those, those gaps. Yeah, I think that that would certainly be a, um, a possibility. And, and like I said, I think the only reason for, for using dollar values is, is that that communicates with a certain, um, a certain audience. Uh, but I think you know, if you can express it in happiness units, I think that would also communicate with a certain audience. And it's not, it's not an either or proposition either. I think that's, uh, that's, um, that's often kind of a mis misperception, you know, just because you're, you're expressing these values in one set of units doesn't mean they can't also be expressed in other in other units. But I think it's also a research challenge. And in fact, we're, we have a couple projects in uh, in in the works right now that try to look at well, uh, can you statistically relate you know um, ecosystem services and natural capital with people's life satisfaction scores? And in fact, yeah, there are some good um, good relationships there. Uh, so you could make that connection, you know, empirically as well. Shifted to what? To, uh, to convenience. convenience. Well, um, I think conventional, you know, neoclassical economics assumes that preferences are, are kind of fixed and given, and we know that's not the case. I mean, pre preferences, if anything, are constructed, you know, uh, by interactions with people, by, you know, accumulating information. Uh, they evolve and change over time, and I think that's one of the things that, that, that we need to recognize. So, you know, the fact that, uh, people have a certain set of preferences now, they're, they're probably not well formed in the first place, and they are subject to influence by, you know, by various things. We might as well try to influence them in a positive direction. Um, how do we do that? Well, well, maybe this discussion of the kind of world that we want, the kind of world we want to live in, you know, will help, help modify people's preferences in, the, in that direction. We know, you know, many of the base assumptions of conventional economics are just not true. I mean, people, People don't behave as individual, you know, uh, utility maximizing, you know, at atoms that that, uh, uh, that have perfect information and know exactly what their preferences are. You know, it's just that's just so far from from reality. And I think um, that's what we need to change. And that's that's what ecological economics is trying to to bring in. You know, how do people actually behave? What influences their both their behavior and their well-being and their life satisfaction? And how do we maximize all of that? I don't think we know the answers, but I think we know we know where the direction we need to go. So, uh, your, your estimates of total dollar valuation are a very powerful argument in favor of nature conservation, but then when you disaggregate the numbers and, and partition out the amount of value that different ecosystems provide, it could also become a prioritization tool. And I'm not sure that would always lead to outcomes that, that I would favor. Right. Well, those that sort of simplistic approach of, of you know sort of benefit transfer and even categorizing these services you know as saying you know as as a series of things that you add is is obviously a, a simplification, and I think we can overcome that by uh, <clears throat> building better, more integrated models that show that these things are not inter not independent. They're they're highly interdependent. Um, you know, and there, there's not the, the categories of land use that we use are fairly arbitrary, and you know, so there's there's a long way to go, and and uh, I think we have to always you know recognize that all models are wrong. <laughs> <laughs> but I think getting that point. 